So TJ Didonoris' work centers on issues of identity, race, sexuality, class, and gender. They utilize painting, videography, photography, music, performance, installation, project-based art, and more in their practice. Using these outlets, Didone Norris explores the impacts of different societal systems, particularly for women, people of color, and queer communities. TJ Didone Norris is a 2017 recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts grant and a 2019-2020 Pollock Krasner grant. They have completed many artist residencies, including Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, McDowell, the Oxbow School of Art, Vermont Studio Center, and Yaddo. They have exhibited their work nationally and internationally, including at the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans and the Lanchini Gallery in London. TJ holds a BA from the University of California, Los Angeles, and an MFA in painting and printmaking from Yale University. I had the pleasure of having TJ as a mentor and professor when I was a graduate student during their time as the Grant Wood Fellow in Painting and Drawing at the University of Iowa, where they are currently a tenure track assistant professor of painting and drawing. TJ Dido Norris has adopted and utilized different personas in their practice, including Black academic artist Tamika Janine Norris. Their most recent solo exhibition, which just closed January 31st at the Figure Art Museum in Davenport, Iowa, honors their recently deceased artistic persona, Tamika Janine Norris, through the mounting of a retrospective comprising the persona's estate. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome TJ Dido Norris. Thank you so much. Yay. Um, it is such a pleasure and honor to be here. And I am so cheesy, Rachel. It is just so exciting to see you like post grad school in this role. I mean, it's just such a special opportunity. This is what teaching and mentoring is all about. It's just, it's awesome. So thank you so much for all that you've done. And thank you for being a part of this invitation. It means a lot. So um, I think we should just go ahead and kick it off. I thought that um, for the context of this, uh, these times, uh, partially Black History Month and thinking about the, the sort of uh, reconciliation of my exhibition that I wanted to screen um, one of the new films that sort of came out of the exhibition, which is a eulogy for uh, Tamika Janine Norris. So I thought we could start by sort of a, a video that, that the Figgy Museum made narrated by Joshua Johnson, who was the registrar and essentially the guest curator of that show, who can um, kind of give a nice framework for the show. And then we'll show some video, uh, the film, and then I'll talk a little bit about the show and then we'll go to some Q&A. Oh, there we go. Oh, you're muted. Okay, can you all hear me now? Okay, <laughs> all right, let me share my screen. TJ Didot Norris presents the estate of Tamika Janine Norris. What part of yourself must you hide or bury for another? Oh no. anticipated. Sorry, everyone. No, totally. Um, we can be flexible as well. Let's see what happens. Okay, I think it's going now. TJ Dido Norris presents the estate of Tamika Janine Norris. What part of yourself must you hide or bury for another to survive? This question is at the core of artist TJ Dido Norris's work. As an artist, academic, daughter, and partner, TJ Dido Norris pronouns they, them, has navigated layers of race, gender, and class-based perceptions throughout their life. These prejudices have presented themselves within the art world, academia, and personal relationships, forcing the Doro Norris to respond strategically by necessity. The result of these interactions is that the Doro Norris's personal presentation becomes a form of politicized performance. Dido Norris's art practice frequently incorporates performative personas to examine the reaction to the biases surrounding them. These distinct personas respond to the different components of Dido Norris's identity 
and time periods from throughout their life. The resulting artworks are simultaneously autobiographical and novel dramatizations. Nearly two decades into their artistic practice, Dodo Norris must reevaluate the distinction between these personas and their identity as an artist. In TJ Dodo Norris presents the estate of Tamika Janine Norris, they continue to unpack their identity, unraveling their artistic legacy through the art making process. This exhibition begins with the death of artistic persona Tamika Janine Norris, pronouns she, her. Tamika Janine Norris was a persona focusing on a society's response to inhabiting a female black body. Her exploration of gender politics is evident in the artwork she left behind. Tamika Janine's entire body of work is on display in this exhibition, including fabric assemblage painting, video, music, photography, soft sculpture, and works on paper. T.J. Dodo Norris is using this retrospective of Tamika Janine's work to honor Tamika Janine's legacy, while also scrutinizing the complex relationship between artists and museums, a relationship that often becomes more fraught after an artist's passing. Norris's work exists at the intersection of current Black, queer, feminist, and women X's movements. Their work is a response to the anti-Black and anti-femme biases that they continue to face and that Tamika Janine probed in her artwork. The death of Tamika Janine Norris is an attempt to lay these embodied experiences of prejudice to rest. I held my breath that whole time. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, and, and I thought that that was just a, as a quick summary, uh, just a great framework. Um, a, because there's so many layers to this exhibition. Um, and I love the framework of the museum making a video uh, to kind of help uh, talk about and frame its role as a museum to sort of help me uh, lay out all of these works over 20 years. So the museum sort of became a warehouse in a certain way. Anyhow, so this film was the culminating film for the show. Uh, so yeah, we can go ahead and share it. And I, I'd like to say possible trigger warning for anybody. Um, I, I can't describe what all the triggers might be for you, but it is sort of um, sensitive content. So.
Dearly beloved, we are gathered here to celebrate the home going of our sister, our friend, and the celebrated artist, Tamika Norris. We offer our condolences to her family, her friends, and to those of us who loved her ever so deeply. Here at Maud Chapel at Yale University, Tamika's own alma mater, we cannot help but notice her absence, which is both deep and great, as Tamika has slipped away to be with the Lord. I met Tamika during our Grant Wood residency many years ago at the University of Iowa. She was yet and then already a brilliant artist and I was in awe of her. In fact, y'all, she fed me when I was hungry. She gave me drink when I was thirsty, even when she herself was not well. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. I recall when Christ says what you do for the least of these you do on to me y'all Tamika was generous she was courageous and you know she was funny as hell I remember Tamika saying Chris if I leave here for you do you preach my home going service and don't you talk all day like you want to but y'all know what I am a truth teller and so you know I've got to tell it I have got to tell it Tamika, like so many of our sisters, our daughters, and our mothers, have been harrowed on to glory by institutional racism, sexism, and the weight of being a black woman in America. In Tamika, we have an example of resilience in the face of adversity, every adversity, and I, for one, am sorry to see her go. Yet, from the lectern here at Yale University, I can boldly declare that she shall wear a golden crown. Y'all, she's going to put on her golden crown. She's going to put on her robe in glory. She's going to tell her story of how she got over. She at home, y'all. She at home in a golden crown. In fact, Tamika left for us a living legacy of art, artifacts, exhibitions, and performances of institutional critique. A legacy of what we can do if we face down darkness every day of our lives, if we struggle, and if we believe that we shall see the glory, that actually the glory of God, the glory of our living God shall be revealed here on earth and then in heaven. I remember the old hymnal that said, Precious Lord, take her hand, lead her own Lord, let her stand. She was tired, we, we were weak, and she was worn. Through the storm, you know through the storm, yes, through the night, lead her own Lord through the light, take her hand precious Lord and lead her home. You know, in the old sanctified church, we would say, yes, 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 yes. Come on, come on, y'all. Yes, 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 yes. As I see Tamika lying here, y'all, my heart says, my heart says, Lazarus, get up. Get up, Lazarus. 
get up. For we love you so. Here today we acknowledge when John the Revelator said, and I heard a voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death, nor mourning, or crying, or pain. For behold, the former things have passed away. And the one seated on the throne said, Behold, I make all things, I make all things, I make all things new. Then he turned to John the Revelator and said, Write this down. But these words are faithful and true. I remember Tanika's performance work, particularly the one in the last it is the last chapter of the book, uh, Radical Presence. Didn't she make all things new, y'all? Didn't she make all things new? Didn't she? But here today we continue her work, both God's work and Tanika's work, so we can say that we are all free at last. We are all free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. But we won't stop. We won't, Almighty, we are free at last. But we won't stop. We won't, Almighty, we are free at last. But we care that they, they need to see the black women in academia have the support that they need to. We know that neither disease nor mental illness, nor famine, nor pestilence, nor whiteness will wear them down and send them hollering on. To their graves. We can stand in the darkness and say we are the light for we remember Micah 6 8 and what the Lord requires of us. He says he's told you oh man what is good and what the Lord does require of you but to do justice to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. But here right now I got to go back. I've got to go back to she shall wear a golden crown. She will put on her robe in glory. She will tell her story today of how she got over. I know some of her beloved sisters so heartbroken. In fact, we know Tamika's grandmother went on the glory only a few weeks ago herself. But we know that God will wipe away all tears, all tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. And like our old folks used to say, our grandmamas used to say, every day will be howly howly and never goodbye. Behold, Christ has made all things new, but let us not today act brand new. You know the difference. God made all things new, but let us today not act brand new. Let us instead remain steadfast, or better yet, let steadfastness have its full effect. Can the choir please sing, for we remember Tamika's work today. Go on and raise the choir. Take me to the king. I don't have much to bring. My heart is torn in pieces. It's my offering. Take me to the king. Truth is, it's time to stop playing these games.
question. Um, and I guess now, yeah, if we could just maybe go through the slideshow. And I'm um, happy to talk a little bit about it. So um, that film is still really tough for me to watch as the maker. It's all still really new. Um, even I'm crying. Um, and what's been really profound about this opportunity is to do a lecture, but also have it be an, an opportunity to have a memorial to actually bear witness and have others bear witness to um, this process and um, why I felt like this work was important to make. Um, it's really interesting. So being, you know, being an artist is such a privilege. It's such an awesome opportunity to be able to exhibit my work and have an identity in the art world while also realizing though, so much of that identity is being constructed by someone other than me. Uh, like my body is highly politicized, right? Um, and feeling like uh, there might've been or might be a glass ceiling for the type of work that a woman can make or a black person can make or what a black woman can make. Um, and even in, even in the studio, as the artist, really wanting a desire or try to figure out a way to transcend that oppressive space of feeling like I'm boxed into making things that are about a certain thing, or I have a certain level of responsibility to, to transmute and feel a certain amount of pain or carry the burden and the weight of many generations of, um, of horror, pain, oppression, et cetera. And, you know, the birth of my practice came out of Hurricane Katrina and my family sort of trying to navigate that. Um, and it's just not, for me personally, sustainable as I've learned over now almost two decades to make work from such an intensely painful place. Like it's important, but in order to remain physically, mentally, and emotionally healthy, there has to be some level of ba balance, right? And, you know, to whom is, like for who is this work? You know, realizing that the majority of the collectorship of this work goes to wealthy white folks. And, you know, what is that doing or resolving in the context of my practice? So um, the birth of TJ actually arrived at the University of Iowa, um, living in like an extremely white space, um, while also having this intersections of becoming a professor, being in a new town, um, also becoming a, a power of attorney over my mother, who I'm, you know, doing elder care for and advocating for, and feeling like Tamika would be highly dismissed on the phone, that I needed to make a very compelling context for my value as a person. Um, and feeling really lucky for, you know, in the context of going to the University of Iowa, for example, to the hospital with my mom and them saying, coaching me, like, you need to let them know that you're a professor here at the University of Iowa and that you're seeking help for your mom. Um, that just being me in my body is just not enough. And the, the pain around that is one thing, but also like I have worked hard to earn the resources to be called professor or whatever. And that I do need to use my, re my resources in a community that I'm building to sort of um, help myself advocate for myself and my family. So also TJ was also birthed and it's just an abbreviation, but it's also a metaphor for like, I cannot show up as wholly myself. I have, many of us have to arrive at places as abbreviated versions of ourselves in order to survive or be or not be too put on blast or whatever. And there are certain parts of ourselves that we can certainly hide because it's not apparent in appearance per se. Um, um, like, yeah, so like queerness, for example. So that's a whole nother story, but how my, my blackness and my brownness and my womanness hold such visibility over my queerness, although my queerness is such a, a you know primary part of my identity as well. Anyhow. Um, so, you know, realizing that even as a professor, I arrive as an abbreviated version of myself in space and wanting to suspend sort of readability of who I was to either a future student. So TJ, they won't know gender or race or assumed race or assumed socioeconomics around race with the name, um, because I've had some really transparent conversations with students who were like, uh, 
who I love and who who I've grown to work with really well, but we were able to sit down and have really wholehearted conversations about our own personal biases, which really helped me think that like uh, institutional critique is such a huge part of my practice. And I thought maybe it would be something that I would leave in a grad school investigation, but realizing as a professor and being within the institution, there is an endless amount of continued critique that I will be able to continue to use as sort of fodder for my practice. So TJ was built out of necessity. Um, so, uh, and, and feeling like I don't know, uh, and, and TJ has desires to, to create work that I feel like is meant to transcend the bubble of what the art world has decided the type of work that Tamika makes, the types of subject matter that that work can sort of gravitate around. So um, you can feel free to read, yeah, there you go. Uh, so those are some of just like the initial ideas that uh, the groundwork that I've sort of been laying for this work. And um, one of the most beautiful things about my practice, I think, is that I'm just the vessel for the thing like at one point I thought oh I'm the artist and I'm calling all the shots but really this practice has really been a gift to me uh, as an opportunity to process um, and work through things that are going on to me and I guess going on in the world and when I I made a film in 2014 that uh, you could tell in, in that film that we screened where uh, I threw the dove and I had longer hair and there was a different it looked like there was a different time lapse. So that was many years ago where I think for the first time I was thinking about mortality and what happens to all the things that we make and how do we as artists find infrastructure or um, a plan? We're, we're artists and we're making all these things. Do, do you have a will and testament? Do you have written down somewhere what you want to happen to all these amazing things that you've made? What, what, what's, what is your legacy, right? Um, so these were some of the questions that I was asking myself uh, at some process with this work, but the actual act of life and death, um, I had not really dealt with. So in that, in that film, uh, it was noted by Christopher McMillan, who was a Grantwood Fellow, and I was a fellow who wrote that eulogy for me, which was a very tough ask for a dear friend. Um, so my grandmother passed a month ago. And if anyone has dealt with the death of a, a, a parent or grandparent, um, I had not up until a month ago. So really, really fortunate and blessed that I've never dealt with grief on this level until a month ago. And uh, what I found myself saying is that um, it's horrible, but it's also a beautiful gift. Like grief is really a gift. It's crazy to say. Um, but I'm learning that. And um, that film of me sort of thinking about birth and rebirth and possibly even killing myself before the world kills me. Like the, I, like the actual fear of feeling like, well, if I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go on my terms, right? Like to actually have to think through that is kind of insane. Like I wanna lay all of this out um, you know, uh, so that there is not some sort of strange inevitability of like systematic oppression killing me or, you know, wanting to get pregnant one day and know, knowing the stats of black women's mortality, uh, giving birth, you know, like all of these things are like, not just research concepts, they're actually lived embodied experiences. Um, so I think it was also like a level of grief, like grieving for a former self, grieving a part of myself that I'd like to lay to rest, grieving the part of myself that gets sort of paranoidly, de debilitatingly fearful of what could happen to me in the world based on what I've seen happen to others like me, right? Um, so it's a, it's a type of a laying of, of a laying to rest. It's not meant to be necessarily like, uh, just like black grief in its most traumatic state. It's meant to say like, we, we all have an opportunity to lay parts of ourselves to rest that we want to let go of. There are opportunities for us to grieve people, events, um, you know, all of this is there for us. And um, one thing that I learned in this whole process too, 
talking to family members or friends and they're like, there's no one way to process grief. There's no one way to do it. And all of it is new. And I didn't know necessarily that I was gonna process my grandmother's grief through this film, but it ended up being a great opportunity to do that because of COVID, there was no funeral for me to attend. There was no Zoom funeral. Um, so it was just really great to have a space to process and have some sort of a ritual that is so layered, right? Like it's my own sort of personified laying of laying to rest or death, but also grieving my grandmother's death. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a million layers to this exhibition and so many things to be said. Uh, a lot of people have been like, oh my God, what do you think? Like you had the show during COVID and maybe nobody saw it. But I really think this was the most perfect time for this exhibition. This is probably the rawest. Um, and I feel like I've done a lot of stuff in my work in the past, but this feels the most like, I wanna say honest. And I guess honest just means like there is no edit. Like everything in the kitchen sink is in the show. Like all of my mother's belongings, meaning uh, uh, while trying to figure out this exhibition, I also had to move my mom who got COVID twice and has been a nursing home and it's a whole thing and moving her estate, which was her belongings out of her apartment. And like, they were hidden behind the walls of the museum. Like everything went into the museum as a storage unit, as a, as a warehouse. Um, the museum became this like catch all site. And that is really exciting to me to think about and how the museum used its infrastructure like, you know, uh, condition reports and uh, inventorying as a way to help support um, my, my work and the sort of archive. Oop. Oopsies, I got a phone call and then it just wiped everything out, but I'm back. You can see me and hear me. Okay, cool. It's so weird. I don't know how to turn all that stuff off. Um, so yeah, so, and then that, that previous slide where everything is just like in boxes, that's just where all the artwork is, you know, like everything that belonged to this estate needed to be in the show. Um, and TJ as now like executor, now I think there's also this really interesting new opportunity of like what happens to artists that die. There is this unfortunate op opportunity for exploitation as well, right? And it's like, well, who's gonna exploit Tamika's estate other than TJ, me, <laughs> like in, in all the best terms, right? Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm happy to kind of like open it up a little bit. I feel like that was a lot to go through the film and then for me just to start talking. Um, so maybe let's just take a quick little breather here and <sighs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel or Olivia, would you be able to um, give other people access now to unmute? I can only see the uh, PowerPoint right now on my screen. Yes. Um, if anyone does have questions, you should have the power to unmute yourself. So feel free to do so and ask a question. I'm also happy to keep talking, but I also just thought a little breathing room might be nice. Um, the chain link fence, I'm obsessed. Um, and I did a lot of wall drawing of chain link fence. And then the museum was able to get access to some actual chain link fence, which was a dream, which I really wanted. And it felt conceptually really important to fence in things that I wanted to feel very protected from the space in some way. Yeah, thanks for that comment. Uh, what a healing and honest body of work. Yeah, I think healing is such a big part of this process. And I think for young artists too, just thinking about like, 
like infrastructure is so important and what that means like as we're you know young makers you make things and it's like one painting turns to five or 10 or 20 and it's like well where do you put them are you storing them in your parents garage is that a safe place is it air temperature controlled will it get warped will it get molded you know who decides these things are valuable and i think the best thing any of us as young makers the best thing we can do is um not consider the work precious but consider it valuable and that's two totally separate things in my mind it's not precious in that muck it up do whatever you have to do to make your work but it's valuable in that you made it and you see the value and what it means to retain um the integrity of that work as best as possible um and that's coming from someone who puts oil paint on bed sheets so what i mean by that is to what degree something can be sustainable my work is not meant to be necessarily archivable in that way kind of on purpose um but i think as long as we're making things you know do your due diligence to see it through to the end which is not just finishing make the thing but how can you store house keep hold the thing um because you just never know you never know what opportunities may present themselves or where you might want it for research for yourself in many years to come and you have those things there as a reference point um, for what you've done. Uh, uh, TJ, there's a question for you in the chat. Um, it is, what for you opens up and closes down as you transition your art practice to TJ? Yeah, okay. I think if I would have read this question in another moment, I might have decided that I didn't know what that meant, but I think I do know what that means. Um, so for me, a big part of it is I think what my work does in theory versus what it does in practice or something. And I guess what I mean by that is like, I feel a little bit hypocritical in that my work is really strong and it does a lot of things, but in, if in my day-to-day -day life, I don't know how to advocate for myself and be as strong and as direct as my work is sometimes, that that feels slightly hypocritical and it's really hard. Um, and that just means little things like, uh, you know, uh, if I need something, how do I advocate what my needs are? Um, and I think in the past, I've shied away from advocating for myself directly. And this is really nuts to say, but I think, well, no, it's not because this is, this is the disease of racism and how it works. There's, there is how people see me, but there's also how I see my result, how I see myself as a result of how people see me. So if, if I'm seen as, you know, crazy or difficult or loud or whatever, at what point do can I no longer suspend the belief of what is all coming at me, right? Of how I'm being uh, understood by the world. Um, so I think becoming TJ allows me, even if it's in preparation for an important phone call about advocating for myself, about getting something shipped back to me or getting a discount on a thing that I paid for that got messed up upon arrival or whatever it is that like there's the practice of in the day to day when I'm using TJ's voice, it's a way to exercise the history of what it means for women to be meek and quiet or for black women to be considered this or that. So it's, a, it's an opportunity for me to step into uh, a voice of advocacy. So, and I, and I liken it to how Joan Mitchell uh, has been uh, said to talk about her work in an interview where she's like, little Joan is making the paintings and big Joan is there sort of overseeing the process, making sure that little Joan is okay. Um, in that way that like, um, even in Joan's own studio where she might even be singular and by herself, she doesn't feel safe enough that there needs to be this partitioning of the selves, the little self and the big self that are multi-consciousness at the same time to keep things going. Um, so there's another question, Can, should I read it? Do you have any advice about starting self-promotion as a young artist or how to get your name out there? 
Well, I really think it depends on the nature of your practice. Um, I think that that is a very different conversation for each artist. I'll throw a few examples out there. Um, since I also make performative work that is um, very direct and persona based and like rap persona characters, I really use the venues for that character. So social media or, you know, like using all the things that are there to, to promote, like putting a really hot video on Vimeo, maybe paying for um, uh, when, when you place an ad, not place an ad, but when you uh, pay for promotion on social media, like, you know, I think that there's, it just depends on the nature of the work. If you're a painter and the work requires a more, I'm going to, this sounds silly, uh, a different type of platform, I think you might want to think about it a little bit differently. Um, I wonder if I'm going to talk to you, Samantha, today. Do it, okay, okay, perfect. So yeah, I don't think that it's a it's a one a one uh, answer fits all artists um, because I think some artists are really good on camera and are really good self promoters and some artists are really good makers and don't want to be face forward or you know persona first kind of thing with their work um, and I think that there are uh, advantages to both and the mystery is really nice and it might be about. Uh, finding ways to use your social media, finding ways to use your network um, to put things out there. But I'm excited to talk more about that uh, with you. TJ, you there's also a, a question from Cameron Gray. Um, I'll, I can read it. Can you talk about the restorative property of the work and the role that art can play into healing generational wounds and traumas? Oh, okay, hold on. Uh-huh. Okay. Again, I'm going to sort of interpret this question a little bit. So um, I think one of the miracles of this show is that I even had access to these objects. So I very lucky, very privileged, very highly favored and blessed to come out of a, a grad program and have um, gallery representation. So I went right out of grad school into working with the Chelsea Gallery, which is sort of, you know, the dream, essentially. Um, but it also means you come out of grad school and there is a dynamic, right, set up between artist and gallery based on, like, I'm the student, I'm young, I certainly need them more than they need me at this moment, right? And, it, and it's not a critique of any one gallery, it's the system in general. Um, I love the galleries that, that I work with, but uh, I think that it's um, this idea that coming out of grad school, yeah, I was living in an apartment or living in a shotgun house. It was not air temperature controlled and galleries would want to show work and you'd ship it off. And the next thing you know, I had no work around me, none of my work, because it was safer at the gallery because they did have the proper infrastructure to care for the work. So this idea of the question, like the restorative property. So in, in a way I'm thinking about the restorative quality of it is meaning like what it, the, 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 the links I had to go through to get all of this work back to me, um, which meant, you know, uh, writing, like working with the University of Iowa to help me get my lab and my studio and all of my things moved as a professor. So. It was kind of like a move uh, that I felt really lucky that I had the resources to utilize. But I think that that's rare, that once you start working with galleries, the work kind of just trickles out um, and you have less and less access to it. And I think the sort of generational wounds and trauma part in, in the context of this work comes from so much of this work is indexed from articles of clothing from my family. So this is not just like paintings that I made from canvas that I bought at the store, the paint that I bought at the store. These objects house the aura and literally the actual bed sheets or the actual drapes or the actual beds, you know, bedspread or tablecloth that or sweater that belonged to my grandmother. So the need um, to get all my stuff back was more than just it being about, I want my paintings. It's like these things house 
my family's history. It, it's an archive essentially um, of, of those things. Um, so, so Cameron said my bad. Um, so whew, healing and healing the generational wounds and traumas. I, I'm waiting on it. I'm here for it. I'm here for healing. Uh, I think it's going to be hard earned in certain ways. Um, I think also I've had to, man, I hope this doesn't sound like poorly toned, but I think so much of my life has been so much about all me and all the generations before and after and all the responsibilities. But it's kind of like, if you imagine being on that airplane and they're like, put that, put the thing on, the air temperature might change. You gotta put your mask on and put your mask on before you start giving masks to others, right? And I feel like I've spent so much of my life feeling like I can just offer masks to others and I'll be okay, I'll be okay. Um, I, I think even in, in, in my grandmother's passing, a part of the gift is feeling that I can let go of some of the responsibility of like all the generations before and after. Like I need to focus on myself. I need to focus on my own personal healing. And this notion of giving care and caregiving, I've been a caregiver for my mother for two and a half years at the expense of not really being able to take care of myself uh, because I've really put all my resources in wanting to make sure that she was okay. Um, and at a certain point, uh, you have to sit down and recalibrate uh, you know, who you're, how you're taking care and who you're taking care of and if you're taking care of yourself. Um, yeah, that might not have exactly answered that question in the most optimistic way, but I think that's as honest as I can be about that. Still got a couple more minutes if anybody has any thoughts. Sorry. Oh yeah, I did want to. So this is Cameron. Um, I wanted to tell you thank you for um, being vulnerable and and being that um, somewhat of a guide of showing how to get to that place of healing. Um, because you know, as an artist myself, and going through a very similar situation to what you went through, as in going through COVID um, and having my thesis show, that's kind of how th this is your work right now reminds me of how that work felt for me and the aspect of putting like you said putting everything there and actually getting that story out or getting those those things that you felt within yourself out so then you can actually not only look at them in a different context but then grow from it like okay i said everything i had to say about this and maybe you still have things that you have to address but you finally did what you had to do um, and now you can move on to some degree um, with a new outlook on life, um, free of some of those things that you mentally put yourself in as in bondage wise. So thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. I feel so seen and heard right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful that, yeah, I, I really think that there are a ton of artists right now that can really, really, really relate. Um, not just in the, you know, trying to facilitate an exhibition or trying to think of, you know, what's important in these times while also going through all of this stuff. So I really commend all of us that are out there still trying to make things happen uh, while all of this is going on. Um, and you're right, I, I, I definitely feel like this exhibition is um, sort of laying things to rest, like literally, but also offering opportunities for new things to be born and that is thrilling. Um, so there's one more thing here in the, okay. Uh, what you said in the beginning about learning, it is not sustainable to make work from such an emotionally painful place. How have you learned to navigate this? How does this show fit into that balance act, balance, balancing act? Because the show is absolutely emotionally soft to beat. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and of course, I love you, dear. And I'm so happy to see you here and I'm, um, you know, following your work and everything that you're doing as well. And I hope that we get to catch up soon. Um, yes, extremely exhaustive feat, um, but necessary. And I think 
the sustainability part is coming. Like even today, like the fact that I'm crying is not that I'm overly emotional, I'm overly tired. And I, and I think that like, there's something, you know, on one hand, I'm so fortunate that like in, in the real world, y'all, I've done like four or five lectures that might've meant I might've been traveling four or five times in the last several weeks, which could not be sustainable. And I'm sitting over here on my couch right now, knowing where the check resides doing this talk. Um, and it just feels like, wow, this is great. And then on the flip side though, after a talk like this, the computers close and then there's nothing which is also very effing weird just to say and it makes me think about well what part of this is feeding the ego what part of this is feeding the spirit what part of this is like for like for me to grow and what part of this is just like tooting one's horn and i've and i've realized that so much of the dinner and after stuff is just like a stroke of the ego not necessary but i'm realizing like oh huh, that's what some of this is. And what am I feeling right now that I don't have anybody to keep tooting my horn for the next three hours and treating me special after a talk? Like, what is that? Um, so I, I think the sustainability part is that, I think I tried to hint at it earlier when saying that like the advocacy, like it is not all gonna happen in the practice. This. There are real life things I got to assess about my life and that we all do about our lives, about what is sustainable about our life wholly as practitioners, as wherever we are employed, as family members, whether we're partners or, you know, a parent or whatever our roles are, you know, to the people in our lives, like, we all need to kind of sit down and take inventory as to what, what is sustainable. And um, for me, what I think, this will, this will be the last, this is where I will leave this. Um, two things. One, somebody asked me in this process, how am I holding space for my grief? And no, like, because I'd never really dealt with grief in this way, I'd never really been asked that question. But then now I'm like, man, how do we fill in the blank? How, how are you all, how are you holding space for your grief? But also knowing that inside of that grief that there's still joy like there's still all these simultaneous feelings happening and so how are we all holding space for our grief our joy our anger our loneliness how are you holding space for it um and i think it's something we might want to take a practice that asking the people around us or asking ourselves how are you holding space for blank the other thing that i would want to say <laughs> uh the, the what is not sustainable is I saw this brief documentary about this, uh, about a, a black woman who uh, made it in like the self-help circuit uh, and then lost everything. Um, and what I gleaned from some of what she was saying was that she was like, I'm a masochist. I like, I did public self, like I did socially accept acceptable self-hate. And I'm like, girl, that sounds crazy. But when she listed off what those things were, I was like, oh shit, I do that. Like not saying no when I need to be saying no to things, overextending myself, um, presenting as stronger than I am in order to remain in favor of a position or a role or my ego. Um, and that this is not good. <laughs> that it is a socially acceptable way of demonstrating self-hate. Uh, to be, you know, uh, uh, oh, the way that I have, have been a careerist and a workaholic because it 